never start your thinking about ISO 222 by asking which token made the list because that single question already assumes something that does not exist. There is no authority quietly approving blockchains. There is no global committee handing out, say, certifications. There's none of that. There is no official audit stamp that turns a network into, say, institutional grade ISO 222. It's not approval. It's not about permission. It's not validation. It is simply a shared language. Just to structure a way for the financial systems to communicate so that nothing is misunderstood. Nothing is ambiguous and nothing is left open to interpretation. That's all it is, bluntly put it. And that simplicity is exactly why it's so widely misunderstood in all of it. The crypto market turned the messaging standard into a myth. Lists circulate, categories form, confident gets manufactured, but I can tell you almost none of that conversation reflects how financial infrastructure actually operates when we say real institutions are involved. And this is key here because in real finance, nobody, I can tell you, nobody cares how confident a system sounds. They solely care about how it behaves when it's under stress. Say when volume spikes, when rules change, and when nobody is around to explain why something broke. This is key here. Because once you generally understand how institutions actually think, the entire ISO 220, 222 conversation becomes quieter, basically, slower and less exciting, and much more serious, I'd say. And that seriousness is exactly where the internet computer begins to look very different to every other ecosystem out there. Because ISO 222 exists because global finance needed structure, to basically put it, for decades. I mean, banks relied on fragmented messaging formats that worked only because systems were much smaller, slower, and more isolated. But as finance has evolved, has become globally digital and always on, the ambiguity stopped being tolerable. So just say a single misinterpreted film became a compliance issue. Say a missing data element became an operational risk. Say, say a vague message became a liability. So ISO 222 solved that by forcing clarity. Every field has meaning to it. Every data point has context. Every message tells a complete story. But here's the part that gets missed. ISO 222 does not tell systems what to actually do. It only tells them how to speak. So what happens after the message arrives is where everything matters here. So from time working in traditional financial markets, one lesson repeats endlessly. Standards reduce confusion, but systems determine outcomes at the end of the day. For instance, a perfect message sent into a weak system still fails. And this is where many crypto narratives quietly just fall apart in all of this. Because there's always that assumption that if a blockchain, for instance, say, can carry an ISO 222 formatted message, it's suddenly ready for institutional finance. But I could tell you, Carrying a message is trivial compared to what comes next. The system, more importantly, must pass it correctly, validate it against rules, apply compliance logic, which is key here, store records immutably, trigger settlement, generate reports, and allow audits years later. That entire life cycle must work together in sync, without exceptions. And to operate in a real ISO 222 environment, many conditions must exist simultaneously. You know, 
the system must natively handle the same XML and JSON structures institutions already use. No, we're not talking about simplified version T. No, not translator shortcuts. Definitely not. The exact formats. Also, the systems must securely connect importantly to existing financial APIs. Banks do not rebuild infrastructure for new technology. New technology integrates cleanly or it gets ignored, to put a blunt. And the system must execute complex logic deterministically. Same input, same output every single time without fail. No surprises, no edge cases that usually work. None of that. Most blockchains were never designed for this. And that is not a flaw. It's just a design focus because to put a block, many networks excel at moving value. Yeah, they are fast, efficient, and reliable at transferring tokens. They are excellent messengers, but messengers do not run the office. And in practice, when these networks interact with institutions, the blockchain becomes a transport layer in all this. The real work, the real fundamental work happens elsewhere. Compliance runs on off-chain servers. Logic lives in middleware somewhere. Reporting lives in traditional databases. Human oversight in all this fills the gaps. <laughs> and what happens there? The blockchain records an event, but it does not control the entire process. And I can tell you from my experience in traditional finance here, and what that taught me is that fragmentation is tolerated only until something breaks. And that break's always inevitable. And when it breaks, nobody cares how innovative the architecture was. They don't give two craps about it. They care how many systems were involved. Every extra dependency increases operational risk. Every handoff creates a failure point. Every bridge becomes something that must be trusted in the whole process. And institutions accept complexity only when they have no alternative. But when a simpler structure exists, it eventually wins. It's inevitable. And this is where architectural differences start to matter far more than just the marketing. And that's why they're not focused on the marketing. And the internet computer was not built as a ledger with optional features, just to say, uh, later on. It was built as a compute platform from the ground up, from its inception, from its birth, and its core unit, the canister, is not a short-lived script, none of that. It is a long-running application, code data, and logic that live together in the same environment. That one design choice, I tell you, eliminates entire categories of risk completely. And I can tell you, from my time observing a lot of elements within traditional finance, I saw how often systems failed. Not because logic was wrong, none of that, but because logic was split across, and I can tell you, across many different environments. One system believed one thing happened. Another believed something else happened. And reconciliation became the real problem in all this. And ICP avoids that by its structural design. And canisters can natively pass complex data structures, including ISO style messages, without a problem. The message does not leave the system to say, be understood. Interpretation and execution happen where the state lives. And that matters for consistency. It matters for auditability. It matters for trust. And even more importantly, it is how ICP handles external communication. Because canisters can make direct HTTPS calls to existing Web2 and legacy system infrastructures with no bridges, no dependencies, no oracles acting as translators. No middleware quietly becoming a point of control in all this. And I can tell you from an institutional perspective, fewer intermediaries in the process 
almost always means lower risk. Banks, I could tell you, do not like black boxes. They want clarity. They want to know where logic runs, where data lives and how updates propagate. And I could tell you another lesson from my experience in traditional finance is that systems, you know, when they upgrade are often the most dangerous moments in any form of architecture. I could tell you different versions running at the same time create subtle failures and validation errors appear. For instance, reconciliation breaks. ICP's synchronized upgrade model reduce that risk. The system evolves all together. And that may sound unexciting, but reliability rarely is. And reliability is exactly what institutions prioritize. That is key and fundamental for them. But now consider the full life cycle of a regulated financial transaction, the whole process. A message is created, okay? It is then validated. Rules are applied. Compliance checks run. Data is stored after that. Then what comes after? Settlement occurs. Reports are generated. Then audits remain possible long after that. But in most crypto architectures, that life cycle that I just talked about is fragmented across on-chain and off-chain systems at the same time. But on the ICP wall computer, that entire life cycle that I just talked about can exist within a single deterministic environment. Now, that doesn't mean adoption is guaranteed. No, not at all. Institutions do not rush. They observe. They test quietly. There's NDAs in the background. They let others fail first. And from a structural perspective, institutions respond to incentives, not excitement. They optimize for downside protection, not upside narratives. And this is why infrastructure shifts are often invisible until they are already underway. Nobody sees it until it's too late, to put a blunt. And that's a reality of how it has always been. Because there is another way also, a layer to this, when we talk about this in conversation that often goes unspoken in all this complexity. Complexity, complexity, it's key. Because markets love to talk about transaction count, speed, blah, blah. But finance does not care about raw volume in itself. It cares about workload. Say moving millions of simple transactions is easy, sure. Processing, say, fewer, richer, regulated transactions correctly is hard because ISO 222 reflects that reality. It prioritizes clarity, structure, and traceability over speed. And I could tell you many narratives focus on throughput because it is easy to market. It's simple to market. Institutions focus on workload because that is what breaks systems. And the wall computer ICP is designed around workload, around hosting applications, around the logic that does not need to leave the system to function in itself. And I could tell you from my time working with the traditional markets from the institutional level, there was one pattern that always repeated again and again. Timing mattered far less than architecture because the systems that we use built on say, solar foundations outlasted those built for attention. And understanding this does not predict outcomes. It simply explains behavior. That's the most important element here about that because there is also a psychological difference between markets, say, and institutions. Markets crave certainty, but labels feel certainty. Categories feel safe, but institutions do not operate on feelings. They operate on process. Process is fundamental. They ask slow questions. They test quietly in the background with NDAs. They watch edge cases. They measure how systems behave over time. Most infrastructure decisions are made long before the public hears about them. And by the time the narrative forms 
and the masses know about it. The evaluation phase is often already complete. And this is why chasing headlines rarely aligns with understanding structure. And this is where most people miss the investable trading opportunity in all of this. So ultimately, understanding infrastructure changes how you interpret everything else. And the key insight is simple, but powerful. Standards do not create trust. Definitely not. Systems do. And when you stop asking who claims compliance and start asking who can actually operate under constraint, the conversation totally shifts here. Because instead of excitement, you see the actual incentives. Instead of hype, you actually see the architecture. Instead of promises, you actually see the processes. And that is the case for ICP beyond the ISO 222 hype in all this. Because everything becomes clearer when you look at how systems actually fundamentally work, not how they are marketed in the bottom line. And more importantly, stay curious, stay patient, and keep questioning structure over noise. A lot of work is happening in the background with NDAs. And if this video cut through the noise and actually gave you clarity and not hot, not hopium, then do me three things right now. Hit like so this reaches people who are tired of being misled. And subscribe too, because this channel is all about understanding where technology, money, banking, and power are actually going before the headlines actually catch up. You could have been it before the smart money get into it and comment with what clicked for you or what you want broken down next. I read every single comment if it's valid. And if you want single instead of noise perspective, instead of panic and clarity before consensus, do me a favor and subscribe now into it. And also let me know what you think, which is very important. Okay. But before I do go, guys, I want to thank you for listening. Hope everyone had a Happy New Year. We're going to have a big 2026 ahead. It's going to be jam-packed with a lot, of, a lot of news, a lot of volatility. And um, yeah, look forward to the big year ahead. And um, I will see you obviously on the internet computer. Stay decentralized. And until next time.